Sarah Hooker is an exceptionally talented and accomplished leader and research scientist in the field of machine learning. She's the founder of Cohere for AI, a non-profit research lab which seeks to solve complex machine learning problems. She's passionate about creating more points of entry into machine learning research and has dedicated her efforts to understanding how progress in this field can be translated into reliable and accessible machine learning in the real world. Sarah is also the co-founder of the Trustworthy Machine Learning Initiative, which is a forum and seminar series related to Trustworthy ML. She's on the advisory board of Patterns and is an active member of the MLC Research Group, which has a focus on making participation in machine learning research more accessible. Before starting Cohere for AI, Sarah worked as a research scientist at Google Brain. She's written several influential research papers, including The Hardware Lottery, The Low Resource Double Blind, an empirical study for pruning for low resource machine translation, and Moving Beyond Algorithmic Bias is a Data Problem, and also Characterizing and Mitigating Bias in Compact Models. In addition to her research work, Sarah is also the founder of the local Bay Area nonprofit Delta Analytics, which works with nonprofits and communities all over the world to build technical capacity and empower others to use data. She regularly gives tutorials on machine learning fundamentals, interpretability, model compression, and deep neural networks, and she's dedicated to collaborating with independent researchers around the world. So we just mentioned the hardware lottery above. Sarah is famous for introducing this concept of the hardware lottery, in which the success of a research idea is determined not by its inherent superiority, but by its compatibility with available hardware and software. She argued that choices about hardware and software have had a substantial impact in deciding the outcomes of early computer science history, and that with increasing heterogeneity of the hardware landscape, gains from advances in computing may become increasingly disparate. Sarah proposed that an interim goal should be to create better feedback mechanisms for researchers to understand how their algorithms interact with the hardware they use. She suggested that domain-specific languages, auto-tuning of algorithmic parameters, and better profiling tools may help alleviate the issue, as well as providing researchers with more informed opinions about hardware and software and how it should progress. Ultimately, Sarah encouraged researchers to be mindful of the implications of the hardware lottery, as it could mean that progress on some research directions is further obstructed. Anyway, if you want to learn more about that paper in particular, watch our previous interview with Sarah. It was really, really good. So anyway, without any further delay, I give you Sarah Hooker. So um, I'm here in London in Cohere's offices with the one and only Sarah Hooker. Sarah, it's lovely to see you in person. It is so nice to finally meet you in person. Uh, it feels long overdue. <laughs> I know, I know. So I think about 18 months ago, we did an interview on your yeah. hardware lottery paper, which you're very, very famous for. It's one of my favorite episodes we ever did. Uh, we ever did. It's, it's, it's a fascinating paper. And I see that pattern of thinking almost everywhere, every mm -hmm. day. So, um, so that's amazing. But um, anyway, You've done loads and loads of work in, in fairness and interpretability in particular, and we'll explore some of that today. But um, tell me about the state of, of fairness at the moment. I think that the state of fairness is, uh, in my mind, there's three main things that fairness researchers need to grapple with that are almost big hurdles right now. So one is that we tend to treat fairness as like a static snapshot in time. But in fact, like one of the key changes in how we think about fairness is this motion over time, this like drift. And so a lot of the things that we think about in fairness may actually change a lot in the future. Uh, like think about a comedy show that you watched 10 years ago and thought was funny that no longer is funny today. So there needs to be, in many ways, a treatment of fairness is like adapting to distribution shifts over time. Mm. Uh, I think the second challenge is uh, we tend to rely a lot on labeled perspectives of fairness. So we assume that we already know what we're worried about and we already have comprehensive labels. The truth is, in most problems, we actually don't know. So how do we audit large data sets? But also, we rarely have comprehensive labels. And uh, this means that sometimes when we treat things as assuming that, it's very toy, very, it's almost like treating it like a toy problem. I think the third is very actually core to machine learning in general, which is that different uh, cultures have different notions of fairness. And so there's mm -hmm. almost this distribution shift again in terms of geography, but that's also very core to fundamental machine learning problems of how do we adapt our models to very uh, 
different downstream tests and different distributions and perceptions of what is fair and how do we want our models to behave. Okay, really interesting. So, so the, the first one is machine learning models, they take a snapshot in time. Yeah. And, you know, things change, values change over time. Um, I'm really interested in this concept of, you said that the labels, because in a way, it's a form of reductionism, you know, we try to understand things. Mm -hmm. And we have this anthropocentric way of reducing things which are intelligible to us. And as soon as we reduce things down to a class label, we, in, you know, we confer lots of bias uh, in, in the process. So how do we wrestle with that? Yeah, I mean, that's one part of it, which is to even attach a label of what we say is toxic. Uh, we may have different notions of what we think, for example, is toxicity, and we may be calibrated differently. And we see this all the time. So there's annotator bias. There's also high annotator variance in a lot of these concepts, like toxicity, like very uh, sensitive notions, like the labeling in someone's race. There's a second issue, though, which is that even if we assume that we as humans are perfect at determining what is toxic, it's really expensive to get human annotations and comprehensive. These are the type of labels where most of the world is unsupervised, and we now have these massive data sets which are largely crawled from uh, really the web that don't have mm. comprehensive labels. And so that's almost a second hurdle. Even assuming we were perfectly calibrated, the assumption that that data exists is already, it's almost, we've, we've already failed because we're not really developing techniques for the real world, which is those labels don't exist. Fascinating. I've spoken with some people recently about how to define intelligence and consciousness and causality, and it, it's, they're all complex phenomena. Is fairness complex in the same way? Uh, I think that it's complex in the, the sense that we... When we talk about fairness, we often are talking about uh, a set of preferences about how a model should behave. And often we're talking about constraining model behavior. So mm -hmm. often the task is maybe a model was trained on data that has all these historical biases, and now we want to constrain it so it's not representative of the data it was trained on. With things like consciousness, I often think we're trying to emulate a certain type of intelligence. It's often very framed in terms of our human perspective. Yeah. So we're not necessarily trying to constrain model behavior the same way, but we are trying to develop models that are able to navigate the world in a robust way. Uh, the conflation with consciousness, I always find to be, it, it tends to become quite muddled quite quickly. I don't know, what's the best answer you've seen to this question? <laughs> um, I've done so many interviews on it recently and they're, they're honestly- it, it Very go, muddled, right? It goes into philosophy very, very quickly. So, yeah. I mean, you can speak about Nagel's bat and um, you know, Ch Chomsky talks about the, the limits of our cognition, so it's impossible for us to understand it. Chalmers thinks that it's just a magical extra on top of function, behavior, and dynamics. Um, so it's not even an intrinsic part of the system. I mean, it, it's it's very, very confusing, but so many topics in AI do do go to, go to philosophy very, very quickly. But, um, okay, this is really interesting. So one thing that I really like the idea of is, um, remember Jan LeCun made a tweet saying, oh, it's all data bias, and you've been one of the biggest proponents of convincing people that there's loads and loads of model bias. Yeah. Remember that paper where you spoke about on the long tail or the low frequency attributes, those are the... Um, th those are the, the data points that get pruned very, very quickly. So um, yeah, just and I know you had a paper about that as well, but can you, can you sketch out why model bias is so important? Yeah, and really good memory. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Um, no, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, what's interesting about this perspective that's both model and data is that we're in this regime of ever increasing size and models. Hmm. And what's interesting about it is that with larger models comes a bigger propensity to memorize. Yeah. And what does that mean? For a lot of fairness concepts, we're talking about fairness concepts where we want either to represent long tail, low frequency attributes, especially if that low frequency attribute is protected, mm -hmm. or in other instances, we want to curb that memorization. And so depending on your notion of fairness, often when you increase the size of the model, you gain this better representation of the long tail, which can also lead to better outcomes for this low, uh, low frequency subgroup. And that's why these things are very interrelated. Uh, the majority of the field has focused on data, but the same way that remedies like data augmentation can help in representation, so can thinking about the optimization choices of your model. And it's not just model size. It's things like, do you use gradient clipping? So in a mm. privacy setting. So, if you're using gradient clipping, that's a strategy for mitigating uh, 
uh, privacy leakages because what it does is it curbs performance on the low frequency attributes. So the model's not really able to memorize the long tail. But that also can lead to fairness trade-offs where essentially by curbing, gradient clipping or noise injection, you're eroding performance on that underrepresented subgroup. Amazing, okay, great. So there's, there's this concept of the tyranny of, of objectives. And when you um, optimize for one thing, it, it's like the shortcut rule, it's at the expense of everything else. And we optimize for headline metrics such as accuracy. So there are lots of trade-offs. And, and also we can talk about this general theme in interpretability recently, which is, you know, when I started learning about it, it was Shap and Shappy values and Lime and all of these post hoc interpretability techniques. And now what I'm reading is that there's a huge focus on actually kind of training the model with fairness objectives in mind, which is a completely different way of thinking about it. So can you sketch that out? So uh, what you're really talking about is kind of this progression of where a lot of research focus is centered. If you think about post hoc methods, it's almost like uh, you are at the finish line, you have a model, and then you're trying to do acrobatics to explain the logic. Also, one key difference in the methods that you really are referring to are these are often single example explanations. Yeah. So they're very focused on for this prediction or for this generation, why did the model do it in this way? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's interesting because in some ways, like by the time you get to the finish line, you're so baked in to the constraints of the model. You haven't optimized it all for interpretability, yet you're just hoping that you can do acrobatics at the end and make it interpretable. Mm -hmm. I think what's a really interesting direction is what you're talking about, whereas can we explicitly optimize for uh, the objectives that we care about? Or uh, can we uh, essentially look at, even for the case of interpretability, can we look mm -hmm. at how features emerge over the course of training? Because that can give you really strong signal about how a model learns the decision boundary over time. So that's often at the overall data set scale. So it's not centered in the single predictions, but in some ways it's very useful because uh, there are different interpretability use cases. One is always going to be the single prediction, but for someone who's deploying a model or someone who's auditing overall model behavior, it's very difficult to know what to do with millions and millions of single prediction ex explanations. In some ways, you kind of want to know the relative. What does the model do really poorly at? What does it do well at? And how can I understand the perception of this distribution, the behavior on the distribution? Okay, okay. So yeah, the, the, um, having model-based and white box approaches are, are really important. Now, I was speaking to Randall Balistriero, and he's a big advocate of the spline theory of neural networks, which I love. And that's this idea, I mean, you, you can actually use it as a visualization device. So it's this idea that in an input sensitive way, the, the, an MLP will kind of subdivide the ambient space up into all of these affine linear polyhedra. And uh, it's really good from an interpretability point of view because you can actually see where the areas of, of you know, the training support and the data density is. The polyhedra are smaller and much closer together. And you've always said before that the challenging and you know, difficult or the low frequency attributes mm -hmm. tend to be very uh, close to the decision boundary. So like having this kind of model-based way of, of understanding, mm -hmm. as you say, during training and, and at the end of training, how the models behave is, is really important, right? I, yeah, I completely agree. This is a very interesting problem for a few reasons. So firstly, looking at relative oh, yeah. difficulty tends to be very interesting because uh, in some ways, like these are the areas where the decision boundary is less firm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting for a few reasons. One is just auditing safety issues. But the other really interesting direction is that we're in a scale uh, of bigger and bigger data sets, but the relationship with uh, how that impacts model quality is less and less certain. What I mean by that is that uh, we now have recent works which show that you can go smaller and higher quality and achieve as much performance with, with needing less capacity on the model side. So ascertaining what are your hard examples and then uh, modifying how you're using capacity so you don't have to treat all these examples equally, which is what we do now. We essentially pass through all examples the same amount of time. Yeah. It can be really interesting in terms of adaptive computation. Uh, and that's why methods which ascertain relative difficulty, but also get a sense of the distribution and spend more time uh, on certain parts of the distribution are really compelling. And uh, it's an area of research which I think is timely. Like uh, it, is, uh, it is answering this question of, do we need as many parameters if we care more about the data space? And we really first really refine our subset selection and can that guide using uh, more efficient models? Yeah, absolutely. 
What would you say to the current culture of sota chasing? And, you know, I think it's fair to say that people aren't acknowledging enough the importance of having models that reflect our, our values as they change over time. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, that's a fun question. That's, <laughs> that's a, a bit of a, yeah. I mean, sota chasing, so I think the, there's almost like, what do I think about sota chasing? There's also the current formula for winning at sota chasing. So right now the formula is very simple. You throw more parameters of the problem, more data. Hmm. It's a very hard argument to, to, to ar or very hard recipe to argue against because it's so convincing. So it has shown clear progress on many tasks. So I definitely think some people should work on it, but it's not the heart of the problem in my mind, mainly because we're having to throw in so much more data and so many more parameters to show gains. And so there's clear this question of how do we do this much more efficiently? And I think most people should be working on that question of really thinking through uh, why we have to essentially extend out our axes here in terms of model size so much to make increasing gains. Um, there's then this question of, which I think is a little bit separate, of uh, how do the models reflect our values and how do they navigate the world? Um, I think there, it's interesting. Uh, I, I don't think that soda is necessarily the problem with models not reflecting our values. Soda is just extending this one axis of how we benchmark, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the big problem is rather, we don't really have uniform values as, uh, you know, a, a world, as, you know, groups of humans. And so I actually think this question of reflecting values is very intrinsic to the question of generalization. Like, how can you adapt models uh, to really reflect uh, different distributions and different beliefs? Uh, and that's really, whenever people talk about the notion of fairness, for me, it's always been intrinsic to this question of, uh, of really adapting models uh, to and creating models which are dynamic enough to navigate the world, uh, even when you have changes over time. Because one of the things we often mistake when we talk about fairness is this idea that's static in form when it's really not at all. Yeah, yeah. Um, reinforcement learning might be an interesting way to, to think about this because you have run one reward function uh, is that reward is enough paper is quite interesting. But um, but also with people that speak about utilitarianism, there, there's one utility function, tends to get very complicated very quickly. And when we have an intelligible framework of what values are, and they might be different depending on where you're on the world, you get to the situation where you're kind of optimizing on many things at the same time. And that doesn't really lend itself to machine learning very easily. Like, how would you approach that problem? Yeah. <laughs> um... I feel like, uh, so there's a few steps there. So one is, would reinforcement learning work for this? So I think... Doesn't have to, I just mean, that's an example of we're optimizing for a single reward. Yeah. So it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't have to be reinforcement learning. Oh, so is the question, would a single word, reward ever work for this type of... Uh, yeah, because I think cause even if, we'd, if you're building an image classifier, there's one objective function. Yeah. And it kind of feels like, well, if, if you care about this type of fairness and this type of fairness, what do you do? Do you take a parameterized convex combination of two and you create one yeah. reward function? So one thing which I find really interesting is just having uh, adaptive development sets. So let's say you care about toxicity. And you have one notion of toxicity in the US, another notion in somewhere else, and maybe these don't align, these annotator groups don't align. Mm -hmm. Right now, our solution is to annotate a lot of data. And so we need those for development sets to then constrain optimization. I'm much more interested in unsupervised methods, which can find similar instances and kind of uh, adapt over time. So take some notion of ground truth, but adapt it over time to uh, really uh, dynamically adapt uh, adjust the development set. And I think that's one way where you can still have a single optimization criteria, but in some ways uh, you're really changing what you're optimizing over. The, these problems are very related to the question of continual learning um, or to uh, really uh, iterative learning. So this idea that over time you're gonna experience new tasks and you somehow need to still have the same overall objective, but you you have to adapt to new data and not be derailed by it. So these are very related questions in a way. Interesting. So on, on self-supervised learning, uh, Randall had a, a paper on that at Neurips where he was um, looking at different um, non-contrastive uh, losses and the way that he compared them was actually by, you know, cheating and reintroducing the labels and putting them in an adjacency matrix. And um, 
I guess what I'm saying is, is that self-supervised learning probably produces better representations and, and you're not kind of focusing, you know, that these brittle um, class labels into the training process. But it feels like by the same token, what we end up with is, is less intelligible. Yeah, this is actually a very important question. So you've kind of pointed out two things which we're slowly realizing about the difference between self-supervised and fully supervised. Firstly, self-supervised doesn't have, doesn't induce the same memorization abilities, which means that it struggles to learn the long tail, yeah. which can help with robustness, right? Because if we're not overfitting to very, very small differences, mm -hmm. then it's harder to find a perturbation that is, you know, non-trivial, but still manages to distort behavior. But it also means it fails to learn the long tail. So it fails at some of this really... Uh, great inductive behavior that we see where, for example, you have good representation on rare instances. Um, and this is a tension. So I, I actually think this is relatively underexplored. And it's uh, by curbing overall model performance, sometimes we have these good inductive biases which can make it more robust. I think the question there is, is this the measure of robustness that we care about ultimately? Because that, that for me is one of the most timely questions for that subfield is that right now, if you talk about robustness, it means totally different things to totally different people and the measures of progress are totally different. Mm. So with self-supervised learning, um, I think that it's good that it's robust, but I'm not convinced that the measures of robustness are meaningful. Like the, the whole LP norm uh, robustness is less convincing to me. Image corruptions are more interesting, but also uh, for me, it's, it's not clear what it's saying because it feels like a lot of the mitigation strategies in particular are to solve for one type of robustness and then you still have this issue with uh, you're vulnerable to other measures of uh, adversarial or sensitivity to uh, robust factors. Amazing. Okay, we'll, we'll get into data augmentation in a minute when, when we speak about your paper. But um, I was trying to find your paper with Randall Bellastriero. He was, he was telling yeah. me that one of the approaches that you used to, to solve this was by having an ensemble method yeah. with like slightly different um, you know, objectives, I think, on a different model. Could you um, introduce that paper? I'm happy to. So that's uh, a paper that we'll be releasing early next year. Uh, it's a paper which looks at a very specific uh, mitigation strategy. So ensembling is very popular because it provides gains overall in performance, but the gains quickly plateau. So typically you can add like five, six ensembles, and then you see the performance plateauing. Mm -hmm. What we find is very interesting and, and uh, fascinating, which is that the gains on your worst case error do not plateau. So where ensembling is really healthy and is in your low frequency attributes. What's even more fascinating is that this can come from just a very simple ensemble. So all you're varying is the stochastic measures of training. So it's your initialization, but nothing else. Very simple. It's a uniform ensemble. And even then, you see these market gains on your worst case errors. So this is a very simple strategy, but it, it's really showing that where ensembling and basically pulling the wisdom over areas of disagreement really helps is on these harder examples to begin with. Mm -hmm. And that can have these pronounced effects that are very cheap, but can produce these uh, really improved fairness outcomes. Amazing. Now, we, we get these long tails everywhere. I worked on the Bing team for a while, and they had the concept of head queries and tail queries. Yep. Does it make sense to think of the long tail as a monolithic thing? No. Uh, and I act, this is one of the uh, hard things about just thinking about the long tail as atypical or unusual examples, because I think the hard thing is right now, when we talk about probabilities or any type of uh, estimate of uncertainty, you can have high uncertainty examples that are challenging, but you can also have high uncertainty examples that are complete junk. And that's why a lot of our mitigation strategies, which are to just augment the long tail or to just upweight the long tail in some way, don't end up working. Because if your data set is mainly junk, then what you're doing is you're just regularizing your model more. And it's really interesting because right now we don't have tools to discern between the two. A lot of model signals. So, you know, going back to the paper that you mentioned, where you have harder examples close to the decision boundary, Part of the difficulty is that you can have hard examples that are challenging because it's atypical, and you can have hard examples that are challenging because they're junk, and both have similar characteristics. So if one area that I think is very useful for this is the key distinction between noisy and atypical is the learnability. So noise, uh, the whole definition is that it's irreducible. Mm 
mm. error. And so mm. you should not see a pronounced change in the rate of learning. Uh, and this is an area in which I think we need much more work, which is to ascertain the difference between the two because the mitigation strategies are so different. For noisy, you want to throw it away. Very typical, you typically want to upweight. You want to really emphasize those are your subset, your core difficult examples that you want to spend more time learning. Um, so this is a very fun area, and it's an area that hasn't had enough attention. Yeah, this uh, I'm trying to think of a name for this because you're, you're talking about a new regime of controlling the algorithm during training. Would you call that um, interactive learning, I think Randall called it? What was the term he used? So uh, interactive learning is one. I also just think of it as adaptive computation. One of the okay. core limitations of our current model is that we treat all examples uniformly and we, we show all examples the same amount of time. But mm. I think that there's uh, really room for just much more focus on adaptive computation yeah. that also distinguishes between these two. Because adaptive computation right now is often thought of as active learning and it's mm. within the lens of just the atypical. Or, and noise is often thought of through the lens of just subset selection, just remove the noise. But in fact, to do things well, you need to discern between the two, and you have to have active learning for your hard examples, but you need to remove your noisy examples progressively. Yes, yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I think folks that do active learning, it's still a very monolithic um, approach, but this, this takes us perfectly to um, the paper that you wrote, uh, wrote recently with Danielle D'Souza, A Tale of Two Long Tales. Um, you examine the um, efficacy of targeted interventions for machine learning models, such as data augmentation, to reduce uncertainty. And the results suggested that interventions can differentiate between different sources of uncertainty, and you just said noisy or ati uh, atypical examples, and can be an effective way to improve model performance. So um, first of all, can you give us the elevator pitch, but can you also define epistemic and aleatoric uncertainty? Yeah, so really it's the difference between reducible and irreducible error. Yeah. So when you have irreducible error, it's almost uh, your, your, the idea that you give more data or that you add more capacity. It's not as if these examples are lear learnable because essentially it's a stochastic mapping. Uh, and in the case of a, su a supervised problem, but it's also just a stochastic input. You can imagine it as like a, a scrambled uh, sentence in the case of an unsupervised problem. And what's hard about irreducible error is that uh, in many ways, when you add more capacity, you're just you're just regularizing, you're you're memorizing junk, but uh, you're it's almost like a regularizer. It's why you need so much more capacity. I think it's one of the main reasons why we see needing such large models to learn web crawl data sets because we have so much junk in web crawl data sets and they're so huge. Mm -hmm. And in order to get a good performance, we end up having to regularize and use all this extra capacity. Reducible error is different, it's learnable. And so with more examples or more capacity, you expect to see an improvement in performance. What that means in the case of distinguishing between the two is that that paper, and Daniel was the first author, was really saying, let's exploit this difference in rate of learnability to distinguish mm -hmm. between the two. And mm -hmm. so that intervention can happen and so you can treat the two groups separately. More recently, I've been exploring this in the sense of uh, how do we audit uh, large-scale data sets? Can we use signal over time to discern between these different types? It's not necessarily differences in learnability rate, but maybe difference in loss profiles overall. If you have something that you codify as ground truth junk or you know irreducible, and you have something that you codify as like learnable, uh, what can you do with by, by knowing those footprints and seeing which are closest to it in the training set? Yeah, it, it's so cool because we, we spoke about exactly the same thing last time. And it's really interesting to see how your thinking has developed since then, because we were saying that there's there's this long tail. And the problem is, how do you distinguish between the junk and the stuff that you actually want to focus on? And and th this this method is actually a very, very interesting way of doing that. Um, OK, so just just to make it a bit more contract, uh, concrete, I think you did give me an example of an atypical data set. You're talking about common cruel. But I mean, can you think of another one? So Common Crawl is interesting because it actually has both. You can think of, so within Common Crawl, you have a lot of junk from the internet, like HTML code, um, mm. or you have a uh, Reddit, uh, like, you know, kind of gibberish, like that are nonsensical. So often these are removed right now using these rule-based approaches. So for example, you'll remove HTML code, you'll remove things which have too many punctuation marks because that's taken as a sign of junk. Mm -hmm. You also have atypical. You can think of atypical in that scenario as you might have non-English 
And so it's atypical, but it's got structural integrity. Like it's yeah. meaningful. It's yeah. semantically meaningful. It's just not in the majority language of your entire corpus. Yeah. And so that's a good example within that of this, you know, reducible versus irreducible. Because if you added more of that language, the model would learn an appropriate structure. It's just that it's such a fraction of the overall data set. Cool. Amazing. Right. So um, you also wrote a paper, uh, When Less is More, Simplifying Inputs Aid Neural Network uh, Understanding. I think you weren't the primary author, but that was when you were at Brain uh, earlier in the year. Yep. And um, you investigated the effect of simplifying inputs on neural network image classifiers and the implications this has for understanding the learning process. Can you give me the elevator pitch? So Robin is the first author on that paper, and uh, it was a really nice uh, collaboration that goes back to what we were talking about before, which is, okay, doing all this acrobatics after training is not the best way to arrive at interpretability because it's almost like we're shocked that the models are interpretable when in fact we never optimize for it. This paper does the opposite. It says, let's optimize explicitly for this by making it part of the process to distill what is important and what are the important bits within the image that are important for end performance. What's nice about this is that you're being explicit about your objective, but it's also providing a degree of interpretability about what is the salient information across the entire data set because it's a global objective. Uh, so one of the nicest set of experiments that I really like is that we added redundant information to a lot of these data sets. So for example, we would add stripes to the data set and we would say, we would preserve the original labels. And so then the goal was, can you, uh, does the simple bits learn to remove the stripes? And uh, this was really nice because in some ways we've crafted the ground truth and we're showing that simple bits actually does remove the redundant information. It's also getting to the heart of what does the model actually need to perform well? Because what this is really showing in these scenarios, it's showing that uh, you're learning what the model actually leverages for its decision boundary rather than trying to alter or understand or arrive at it after optimization when we no longer have some guiding constraint. Um, yeah, fascinating. Um, what approach did you use to measure you know, the, the simplicity of the inputs and how did you, what objective did you use on the model? Yeah, so for, for actually measuring the simplicity, we just use Bit. So it was like we it was generated using just a simple generative model, like is, and okay. uh, that was then used to guide the optimization process. So we're trying to minimize the number of bits uh, while still preserving the end accuracy on the task, the original task. Fascinating. Okay, and um, what kind? Of, you, you said that you created an artificial test bed. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that was just a series of tasks, but we have some notion of what's redundant. So you can imagine one example is we concatenated two data sets together, but preserved the labels of one of the data sets. And so then uh, the, the, a good simple bits algorithm would remove the other data set that's not actually related to the label. So that's what we see happening, which is really nice because it's a good way of, uh, often with interpretability problems, the hard part of evaluation is not establishing you don't have ground truth. Otherwise, you wouldn't need the interpretability method in the first place. And so what's nice about this is we're kind of crafting a testing bed to make sure that our method is being reliable. Oh, cool. And um, what impact would it have on the performance? It's a, it's a frontier. So it's kind of fun because this is what I also like about this approach is that you're being explicit about the trade-offs. Whereas often when we optimize for like a saliency map or individual explanation afterwards, you end up perturbing the input, mm -hmm. but you're not actually being explicit about how it would have impacted the classifier. Whereas here you are, you're making a part of the optimization process. And the truth is that a certain amount of bits, we see pronounced degradation, mm -hmm. but for, uh, for really a, a range that's uh, in between, I think it depends on the data set, but uh, you would see this nice uh, kind of stability where you wouldn't see as pronounced trade-offs. And I think that's part of equipping practitioners with figuring out where do you see this erosion? Because um, ideally, you distill what's the most important feature is while preserving the same amount of performance. Amazing, amazing. Okay, so um, what else have you been looking into? One of the biggest questions I'm interested in right now is how do you do uh, efficient subset selection on large data sets? So, so many of the techniques we have for selection are very expensive. So you talked about uh, influence functions. That's an example of a very uh, 
uh, or memorization scores, those are very expensive techniques. Mm -hmm. uh, we need something that scales. And why this is interesting is that uh, one of my hypotheses is that we can get away with much smaller models if we care more about the data space and scoring the quality of data. Uh, another area is uh, really uh, we have our research community. So we have both the full-time research lab as well as the research community. And just structuring more problems where we can uh, really help support the curation of resources for underserved problems like multilingual uh, data set representation and also decentralized training I find really interesting. Can we have uh, pools of researchers that can have trusted devices and have this really interesting collection of resources and what types of hardware, like if you had a heterogeneous hardware landscape, uh, what type of chaos does that cause? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Okay, w wonderful. Now, um, I've been using large language models a lot recently. Everyone's talking about it after chat GPT and we're here in Cohere's offices, so language models are the, the, the modus operandi, so to speak. Um, what, what are your kind of high level thoughts about what's going on with language models at the moment? A lot of what we're seeing is an increased focus on annotation. So uh, I think what we've seen so far is that you can get big leaps in performance by doing web crawl data sets, but the real gains are coming from uh, being very selective and careful about your fine tuning stage and yeah. particular like instruct uh, style prompts. Uh, I think there's a few open questions there. So one is the transferability uh, of uh, instruct style prompts. Uh, from one architecture to another, but another is uh, how do you curate this in a meaningful way? Um, and also what types of behaviors can you induce based upon the data sets that you collect? Um, another interesting direction I think is increasingly, we have these large language models, but right now uh, there's very few places which can actually make them accessible. So uh, I think there's a lot of questions around efficiency and how do you actually deploy large language models at scale. Um, and uh, these are very central to even uh, this question of uh, why do we need to keep on extending the simple formula to get at the same behavior. Interesting, interesting. Okay, let's talk a little bit about, you said instruct, but we'll, we'll call it RLHF. So yeah. you know, um, sort of reinforcement learning, fine tuning to align with, with human values yeah. or preferences or whatever. Um, the, the alignment people talk about it, we're using it in all of our models. What do you, I mean, in really high level terms, what does it do? Yeah, I actually have a grumpy take about this. I okay, don't think please. it's that different from just treating it as a supervised uh, fine-tuning problem. Uh, I think what it does is, uh, so it's really interesting because I think what's going to emerge, uh, probably given the pace of research over the next half a year, is just more ablation showing the impact of the quality of annotations versus the actual optimization procedure. So the reinforcement learning part, I don't see as intrinsic to the gains that have been made, but what has clearly produced a lot of value is just having these really comprehensive annotations and an investment in uh, just the type of interactions that we would consider very um, uh, very high caliber dialogue. Uh, and so I think that paired with the optimization be objective being RL, it, it, for me, it, my grumpy take is it matters less. I think you could uh, structure it uh, along a few different objectives, including just supervised <laughs> fine tuning and still achieve very similar results given that you had a big enough base of annotations. Fascinating. I mean, do, do you see that in any way a contradiction to, you know, we spoke about Jan Lacoon and it's all in the data and so on. And there's, there's this really interesting kind of continuum in the, the life cycle of machine learning models it starts with the data. And then you have like the, all of the different inductive biases in the model. Randall's done some interesting work kind of almost trying to squeeze out the inductive bias of data augmentations. So in, in a sense, it's almost like you're saying, oh, it, it is the data that's really important. It's not so much the model. Is that something we should aspire to? I do think it's primarily the data here. The optimization objective, if you think about it, RL, the way, the, what it actually means, uh, it, it feels like window dressing on this problem rather than like the, the core uh, contribution of the set of techniques. Uh, much more important, I think, has been having a rich set of annotations, which uh, really express both the quality of human engagement and then having some type of ranking system. Uh, 
But, you know, RL is just one way of doing that, right? You can also do that by being more selective about what you use as your fine-tuning data set mm -hmm. and then fine-tuning. You can do it by process of subset selection of all your collective prompts, and you can also do it by process of ranking in some way, RL being one possible way to do so. I think people gravitate to what, maybe we should call it shifting right and the data is shifting le left. People gravitate towards shifting right because they have this rather fanciful idea of emergence and lots of amazing thing hap things happen if only we have this blank slate unified approach to machine learning training. And what you're leaning towards is almost recognizing and admitting the complexity and what we need to do on, on the data side. So it's a little bit more nuanced. So yes, if you have unlimited you know, compute and you can extend your model size as much as possible, uh, you can throw a lot of parameters of problem and uh, treat it as a uniform problem. Uh, but I actually think we just need to be better at sampling from the underlying distribution that we want to represent. And in some ways, this is the core of machine learning overall. This is, you know, often our goal is for some representative downstream task, we want to have a, a distribution that we can sample from, that we can train on. And I'm suggesting that we're going to progressively, as we get better at sampling, because right now we essentially just do a comprehensive sweep and end up with a lot of junk. As we get better at sampling, I think we can gain a lot on the model efficiency side. Interesting. So, so two quick things. on, on People have cited RLHF as the biggest success of reinforcement learning, which to me is a damning indictment of I reinforcement know. learning. I know. But um, <laughs> I, did, I did read, I don't know whether you saw, there was an article on, on um, Less Wrong. I'm not sure if you read it, but it was visualizing the um you know like the 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 um the probabilities of the next token with RLHF and without and what it seems to do is kind of like it you could you could I want to I want to ask you whether you think it's robustifying or the opposite but it, it makes it much more likely that you would get a certain trajectory because it kind of like fattens the you know the the probability margins for certain tokens in respect of certain prompts so do you think that's a form of robustification or brittleization oh that's fun I haven't read the article what do you mean by robustification versus simplification? So, so, so they, they, they say that RLHF does a couple of things. So robustification in the sense of like, you know, given you, you can ask things in slightly different ways and you'll get the same answer mm -hmm. and the answer will be more aligned with human preferences. Mm -hmm. So you could argue that that's a form of robustification. But people have said, oh, the models are less creative. They're less kind of random and crazy than mm -hmm. what they were before. And I'm not quite sure using my machine learning lens whether, whether you could think of that as robustification. Uh, yeah, I think that it, so I guess there's two questions here. Is RL the only way to get that? I would argue, right. no, there's other ways that you could achieve that. One is by just subset selection and spending more time in annotation. You probably implicitly end up guiding certain preferences that are more aligned with our own. So it's not clear RL is the trick here. But let's say, okay, let's take the premise as is and say, is that creating something more robust or is it creating something more brittle because it doesn't learn certain parts of the distribution? You're kind of upgrading certain parts of our preferences or what we would like to engage with. Um, the, the problem which we have yet to solve is adaptation, right? This is yeah. the core thing. So it's capturing our preferences now and that's in some ways making the model more robust because it's capturing a, a, a perspective of what mm -hmm. we, how we want to engage. But that's going to change the same way that the long tail now is on the long tail in the future. And this is one of the big open challenges for researchers is how do you adapt? One of the most simplistic ways uh, that we are currently learning about the world is that we have these global updates. And so we essentially are training models that are uh, memorizing a distribution. But as soon as we introduce new data, we override everything. And yes. this global update is at the core of the issue, as well as uh, uh, this need to treat all data equally. These are really, we don't have a notion of adaptive capacity or modularity. And the, this is one of the biggest issues that our current models grapple with, because regardless of whether this is making it more robust the current distribution, in some ways it's brittle, right? Because we're not exploring the boundaries or we're not when when we have a different distribution or set of preferences mm -hmm. how do we adapt the model itself i agree that's a huge issue so um language models are fascinating they they do what is basically a trivial objective it might be a denoising autoencoder or, or autoaggressive decoder but you're just doing something basic and you get this emergent you know stuff happening so you can look at it in a, in a different domain it's not just a hash table anymore it's doing something magic 
and then we can discuss whether or not it actually understands mm -hmm. whether you can call a language model a type of knowledge store or not because it's rather fanciful but you can kind of say you know like when i do web development you separate the style and the structure mm -hmm. and now i'm separating the knowledge from the presentation so i can say take this sarah hooker interview and present it as if Le Le you know leo tolstoy wrote it <laughs> right and and it's kind of like internalize the knowledge yeah. So if you do believe that there's a, there's such a thing as a pure representation of knowledge, so that that's one thing. But the second part of the question is, if you do believe that there's a pure representation of reasoning, right? Because these things do reason. Presumably, you could, rather than using it the way we do now, you could do all of the stuff you're talking about. So it could have information that reflects our values, and you could use it as a reasoning module on the top. Yeah, I think you're getting to something important, which is that. Uh, the best evidence in support of what you're saying, the second point, which is can you use it as a form of reasoning, is just the effectiveness of few-shot prompting, right? Because often you're adapting it for an entirely new task. There's no gradient update framework. And yet mm -hmm. we're inducing really uh, behavior that for many people is very compelling and is very, you know, fulfilling the desired angle. So that would be the, the strongest uh, support of the second point, which is uh, where it, having uh, an understanding of huge colossal data sets appears to be imparting this ability to interpolate over high dimensional spaces in a really interesting way uh, in which we don't appear to need explicit gradient updates often. We mm -hmm. can often induce it just by prompting in certain ways. The counter part to that is that prompting right now is like tea leaf reading. <laughs> so like <laughs> we have different models and the same prompts don't work. We have extremely intelligent, trained researchers who are kind of probing the model, like reading a horoscope. This is the, kind of uh, very brittle in many ways. And so one thing that we're, we're, we're clearly not gathering is a good understanding of this high dimensional space. So even though, uh, it, to your second point, we're clearly creating uh, general models which can be induced to produce certain behaviors, mm -hmm. the mechanism is not at all well grasped at this point. And so we kind of end up bumping into it often. Uh, and this is a fun, open question to think about. Can, is there such a thing as a general prompt that would work on many different architectures? Or is it always going to be uh, really this probing of the high dimensional space to induce certain behaviors that w we think are interesting? Interesting. Okay. So, so there's a couple of ways of thinking about prompting. I was speaking to a professor from Imperial earlier and he was kind of saying, oh, oh, don't worry, prompt engineering will be a dead job next year because the language models will start to get it. And then that's one way of thinking about it. But I'm actually thinking, no, the, the, the prompt is, is important. You know, some people think that embodiment is important, right? Um, it's almost like the language model is embodied in the prompt. There's something magic in the prompt. I'm giving it the cognitive priors. I'm kind of structuring how it fits. This, you know, it's almost like a, a, an interpreter for a program. There's something very important happening there. But do you think that as language models get better, the type of prompting we do will converge or change? Or do you think that it will always be a bit of the Wild West? I think that if it remains the Wild West that it is, if it remains so high variance, like the structure of the prompt matters, the template matters, the model matters, what the data set was matters, then it's hard to know if what we're doing is not just probing the decision boundary uh, until we find a configuration that works, and that's not science. Yeah. So my hope is we converge to a better understanding of how these high dimensional spaces are formed and we can probe in a more effective yeah. way. Uh, it's also interesting to think about, like, how does this variance, how is it impacted by things like scale? So as we get to much larger scales, do we see some type of stabilization in what we, what we see as uh, the effectiveness of prompts and the ability to guide with less work? But right now, for me, prompt engineering is less a science and more it's really just a probing role where you're using your human decision boundary to understand the model decision boundary by doing enough configurations. And that needs to change if it's going to be a scalable approach. Yes, I, I quite agree. One, one thing that I find remarkable, though, about language models is that even though they, they do have certain computation limitations and even linguistically, that I mean, that they've mastered syntax nearly, but there's no semantics. There's no, well, there, there's a little bit of semantics. There's no pragmatics. We were talking to Laura Ruiz about um, implicature the other day. So, but in spite of these limitations, it's like, weirdly, when we use them, we can fill in the gaps and it's still yeah. going to be a transformative technology. It works remarkably well. But, but you know, just, just talking about the limitations, 
I mean, I, I just mentioned a few and symbol grounding is another one people talk about. I mean, like, how do you weigh that up? I think it's a really exciting technology. So what you're talking about was Laura's work. Uh, so that was work. Uh, I, I was also involved in that. Laura was the first author, so she really championed oh, so it. I completely forgot. No, you were no, on the, no, sorry, no, Michael. no, not at all. So I feel so I, bad now. No, no, no. I mean, you were on the, yeah, I'm no, sorry. Laura is incredible. And she <laughs> rightly, so she led that. So it's really her I'm work. I'm so sorry I forgot. Sorry, no, yeah. no, no, no. Yeah. Don't even worry. But I think what's interesting is that... Uh, we see this failure of these certain types of behavior, but those are really hard behaviors to learn in general. Yeah. Why I think we're able to fill in the gap is that uh, our language is very dense communication format to begin with. Yeah. So to be honest, if two English speakers meet, uh, they can have zero shared background or references, but still communicate with complete ease, right? Mm. And so we're already choosing a very dense representation, which is why I think uh, we're so effective at filling in gaps because it's already communicating a lot, even if it's not perfect. And this is something why language is so interesting to to think about, but it's also why I think it's an incomplete version of the ability to navigate the world robustly. Uh, because the challenge is, what do you have, what, what, how do you deal with much more sparse, less dense rewards? Um, yes, indeed. Before we close out, is there anything else that's top of mind that you'd like to tell the MLST audience, what you know, what what's exciting you at the moment? I am just delighted to finally meet you in person. This is so <laughs> nice, and I just want to say thank you so much for uh, everything you do for the ML community because it's such a so cool seeing all the interviews and uh, just your coverage of scientific communication in general. So I feel very thank you. I I really appreciate giving. Thank you so much. Hopefully, I didn't uh, didn't. Uh, for everyone too much with subtle details but oh, it was amazing no, we love we love the details okay yeah we um we absolutely embrace it and um, sarah thank you so much i really thank appreciate it thank you so it. much yeah amazing. happy holidays amazing